happy to see everybody here this morning. Our uh, order of worship will be uh, Brian has our opening prayer, and then Kurt will lead us in taking the communion, and uh, Jason has the scripture reading, and then Andy has our closing prayer and announcements. Our first song will be number 48, if you'd uh, please turn there, number 48. And uh, I, was, I was looking at this song, and it almost could have been written straight out of our study in Job. And so after this song, we'll have our, our opening prayer. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him dearest joys would fade, anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid, anywhere, anywhere fear I cannot know. Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over drearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep. When the darkening shadows round about me creep. Knowing I shall wake and never more to roam, anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Bow to please. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we are so blessed with this beautiful day that you've given us for this privilege and honor to be here in your house today. Dear Lord, we just pray that as we as we do go through our worship with singing of praises and hearing your word, that we write it on our hearts and our minds, that we prepare ourselves daily to stand up for what we believe and to defend our faith. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your son Jesus, who you sent to die for us. We thank you so much for all the many blessings you give us on our daily walk. We just pray that you continue to bless us. Pray that you be with those who are not here today. Or be from spiritual weakness, give them strength and guidance. Give us the words to speak to them. We be from sickness, be with the doctors, give them strength to overcome them and travelers to see them to their destination safely. We just pray that you will be with us throughout this service. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Before we take communion together, uh, let's sing number 30, uh, 732. Number 732. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus has died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us. 
praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our way. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. It is time for us to participate in the remembrance that Christ has asked us to do on the first day of each week. In that song that we just sung, there's a short phrase that says that he has bought us. We sometimes forget what that really means. He sacrificed himself for our sins. And as we know from our Bible studies, uh, sin requires sacrifice. And if it wasn't for Christ, I don't know what the sacrifice would be, but it would, it would require death. So Christ gave up his life for us, for our sins to be washed away. And that is a glorious thing. And in Mark, we're all familiar with the Last Supper, I guess is, it's called. We're all familiar with how that goes. And in Mark, we read there, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat, and this is my body. Then a short time later, he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Speaking of the cup that he had blessed and given thanks for. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you so much for the remembrance for this memorial that we're about to participate in. We thank you so much, Lord, that, that your son was willing to be obedient to you and to sacrifice himself for us. And now as we partake of this unleavened bread, Lord, 
which to us as Christians represents your son's body. We pray that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. Lord, again, we come to you in prayer. And as we are about to partake of this fruit of the vine, Lord, again, which to us as Christians represents the blood that your son has shed on the cross. We are so thankful, Lord, that he had so much love for us that it, that it, his, his love and his shed blood cleanses us of our sins. We pray that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you, Lord. Amen. Please turn to 535, number 535, and after this uh, song we'll give back as we've prospered. Praise the Savior, ye who know him, who can tell how much we owe him. Gladly let us render to him all we are and have. Trust in him, ye saints forever. He is faithful, changing never. Neither force nor guile can sever those he loves from him. Then we shall be where we would be, then we shall be what we should be, things that are known not nor could be, soon will be our own.
Join me in prayer, please. Lord, once again, we come to you in prayer and we thank you for your blessings. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, for how you watch over us and preserve us and take care of us. And so frequently, Lord, forgive us for not keeping that at the forefront of our minds, that you're with us daily taking care of us. We pray now that uh, as we return a portion of how you've blessed us uh, to you, uh, we pray that you would bless the giver and the, and the gifts, that uh, these funds, Lord, would be used wisely for the furtherance of your word here in this area. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please turn to 396, number 396. Yeah, after this song, we'll have our scripture reading, and then Mike will, will bring us the word. How to reach the masses, men of every birth, for an answer Jesus gave a key, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up, still he's been from eternity. Savior up for them to see. Trust him and do not doubt the words that he said. I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Still he's been from eternity. Savior, see, then men will gladly follow him who once thought, I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up, <coughs> lift him up, still he's feet from eternity. Mark number 31 for the Song of Invitation, number 31.
Uh, Today's scripture reading will be in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. And he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within a defile. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's such a beautiful morning. I am so excited because my entire front yard is grass now with the exception of one little spot in the very front. I just want it to dry now so I can start mowing the grass and spending time outside in my bare feet stepping in the grass. It'll be so much, so much better than the snow. I'm so glad it's finally going away. Not that the snow isn't beautiful, but, you know, there comes a time when it just needs to melt off and go away. <laughs> Well, this morning we're going to be continuing on in our study in the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to be talking about the true source of spiritual defilement, the true source of spiritual defilement, because true spiritual defilement is a condition of the heart and is a result of neglecting God's commands. As we begin our lesson this morning, I'd like you to consider a list that pertains to various activities believed by some to be connected to spiritual purity. There are a lot of things that people think are connected to spiritual purity, but I'm only going to list a few of them. Rosary beads. Most of us know what rosary beads are. These are used to count prayers, and they tell you which prayer you're supposed to say. The burning of incense. This is used to simulate the prayers of the faithful rising to heaven. The lighting of candles to set the mood or to simulate our prayer, which is offered in faith, entering the light of God. These are directly from online, from places that do this. So this isn't just what I think. Wearing of religious clothing. I looked up, why do Catholic priests and bishops and things like that wear the pomp and circumstance that they wear? These are to symbolize the wedding garments we are to wear when Christ returns to show how holy we are. And that's why they have different ones for different positions in the Catholic Church. You have the Pope, who's the most holy. That's his garb. And then further on down as you go, people are still holy, but they're not as holy as the Pope. Okay. <clears throat> what do all of these have in common? Rosary beads, burning of incense, lighting of candles, wearing fancy clothes. What do they have in common? I think you said it. Yes, they are traditions of men, and they are in no way connected to spiritual purity at all. They have nothing to do with your spiritual purity. What I mean by spiritual purity is the idea of being spiritually right in the sight of God, not man, God. In our last lesson in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus went, was confronted by some Pharisees, if you guys remember from last week. These Pharisees believed his disciples were spiritually defiled because they had eaten their food without first washing their hands. The Pharisees believed one could not be spiritually pure without following the tradition of the elders, as we discussed last week. They believed to eat with unclean hands would cause you to become spiritually defiled. Let's look at Mark chapter 7 and verse 5 just briefly here. Mark chapter 7 and verse 5. Mark chapter 7 is our main text, so if you've got a marker, put it there. Verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So their question was about not following the tradition of the elders. What Jesus is dealing with in these passages is similar to the list I asked you to consider just a few moments ago. <clears throat> Many believe that by holding to their religious traditions, they are spiritually pure. The problem with this way of thinking is that these man-made acts or doctrines offer no true benefit over spiritual defilement. An even greater problem is found when the heart of the one holding to these man-made traditions is examined. 
Many will hold to their religious traditions, thinking they will make them spiritually pure, yet all the while their heart is far away from God. This is the case with the religious leaders of Jesus' time. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 6. And he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commands of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. Remember we talked last week, 620 traditions they put above God's word. <clears throat> we see this today, do we not? Traditions being put above God's word to no avail. Think about this. Drive-by shootings with rosary beads hanging from the rearview mirror. Drug dealings with a statue of Mary on the dash. How about any number of defilements while someone is wearing a cross or tattooed with a cross on their body? Those things don't make you any more holy, do they? They're just things to give you the perception that you are holy. In our lesson today, we're going to find that the truth of the matter is True spiritual defilement is a condition of the heart and is a result of neglecting God's commands. So I want to consider our main text today. It's going to be chapter 7 of Mark, verses 14 through 23. Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So from this text, we're going to reveal two truths, two things we're going to see. First, that which does not defile a man. And second, that, second, that which does defile a man. So let's start by considering that which does not defile a man and go back and read verses 14 through 19 with me. <clears throat> this is where our first point is being pulled from. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? As we've studied from Mark chapter 7 and verse 7, And in vain they worship me, teaching the commandments, uh, the teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men, the Pharisees had taught their traditions as if they were the laws of God. Remember, we went over that last week. Here, Jesus was guiding the people away from the false teachings of the Pharisees, and they needed to pay attention and understand what he was about to say. Look at verse 14 of chapter 7. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. Hear me, everyone, and understand. Akuo, that's a hearing with an acknowledgement that you're going to study that and completely understand it. Hear me, everyone, and understand. Here the Christ has demanded that they pay the closest attention to what he is about to say. 
He was saying, give diligent attention to the meaning of my words so that you may understand. This is from the literal translation. He began by telling them that nothing outside the man which goes into him can defile him, right? Verse 15, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, Jesus says. Nothing. Now, think about that for a second. There are things that we can put into our body, chemicals and such, that will kill us. But there is nothing that can defile us as a man. Nothing that goes into the mouth and in the stomach in the way of nourishment makes a man unclean spiritually. Specifically, Jesus was speaking about eating food with unwashed hands. Let's see what Matthew has to say about this in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew's account. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 11. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Now skip down to verse 20 with me. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man, Jesus says. He made it clear that what his disciples had done did not defile them spiritually. He also made it clear that the teachings of the elders was wrong, as we repeatedly went over last week. As in the past, we saw that his disciples did not understand what he was telling them. Go back to Mark chapter 7 and look at verse 18. Mark chapter 7 and verse 18. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Let's consider Matthew chapter 15 again. I know we were just there, but let's go back there. Matthew chapter 15 and look at verse 15. Then Peter, on behalf of the rest of the apostles, answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. Well, first of all, we know this is not a parable. Okay, This is Jesus stating fact. So Jesus has to explain to them, I can't believe you don't understand this, right? Jesus was asking them as his disciples, who have been so highly favored with his teachings, if they were void of understanding. You don't understand this? Do you not see and understand, he's asking? Is it possible that their minds are on the physical? Right? Because they see washing hands and eating food, right? That which comes out defiles? It was never a defilement to have excrement in the Old Testament. It was never defined as a defilement. Was Jesus speaking of something physical coming out of the mouth? They had no idea. They were totally at a loss for what Jesus was talking about, right? Jesus explained what he was talking about in verse 19. Mark chapter 7 and verse 19. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. <coughs> he did this by explaining why what goes into the mouth cannot defile. It cannot render his soul polluted. It cannot make him a sinner. And Jesus provides two reasons. It does not go into the heart, which means it does not reach or affect the mind or the soul and thus cannot pollute it. It goes into the stomach and is eliminated. That's where nourishment goes. All food that is taken in serves its purpose of providing the body with nutrition and that which is unneeded is eliminated. We all know this from childhood. Jesus was saying that food cannot defile because it is only food. Under the Old Covenant, there were unclean foods, though. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 11. Go back to the Old Testament with me in Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 11, and let's begin in verse 1. Leviticus chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock herrix, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, hooves is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. 
Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Okay, and it, he just goes on listing all of the foods that are unclean and clean for them to eat, right? They are unclean, what does he say? To you, to you. They are unclean. But eating or coming in contact with unclean foods was not the cause of the defilement. All right? There is nothing intrinsically sinful about these foods. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. There's nothing sinful about these creatures, right? And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So evening in the morning was the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So none of these animals, their flesh is not intrinsically sinful. God told them, them specifically, don't eat or touch these foods. But let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 now in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Nothing about these animals was sinful. Defilement from foods came from disobeying the command to not partake of or come in contact with these, even if it was accidental. The defilement was going against God's word, not the animals themselves. Although they were health issues with these food items, the bottom line is God provided a way for people to show themselves consecrated to him by abstaining from these specific foods. Go back to Leviticus chapter 11 with me. And look at verses 44 and 45. Leviticus chapter 11, 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. God gave them this list of creatures they were not allowed to eat so they could be consecrated as a holy people to him. That's where the defilement comes. Stepping away from that consecration and eating or touching whatever you want to, not the food itself. And by following God's commands to abstain from these foods and adhering to the purification laws if they came into contact with them, the people demonstrated that God was their sovereign God. Thus, they showed themselves to be consecrated to God. So what the scribes and Pharisees were accusing Jesus' disciples of was completely unfounded. And they, in fact, were spiritually defiled because they were setting aside the commands of God for their own traditions. Man is not spiritually defiled because he eats food without first washing his hands. Why? Why is he not spiritually defiled? Because what goes into a man cannot defile him spiritually. It cannot. Man is defiled because he follows his own path and lives contrary to the will of God. It is evident that true spiritual defilement is a condition of the heart and is a direct result of neglecting God's commands. With that said, Jesus now turns to a deep, the deeper matters of what he is saying, that which does defile a man. Let's bring Mark 7, 20 through 23 back to the forefront of our mind. Mark 7, 20 through 23. 
our scripture reading. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. Don't forget that comma. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So what defiles a man? Jesus answers that in verse 20. What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. That which proceeds out of man comes out of his heart, he says in verse 21. The word for heart here is cardia in the original Greek, all right? Here it refers to the whole of man, that which he truly is. It's not talking about the organ. That's a different word. It's talking about the whole of man. This is the thoughts and actions of his mind, all right? So a lot of the times in the scripture when you see the word heart, it's actually talking about this, what's going on in their mind. Not your heart. Your heart just pumps blood. Your mind is what controls your emotions and your actions and everything else, okay? As Jesus <clears throat> continued, he spoke of that which proceeded from the heart and defiles a man. The list can be divided into 12 or 13 conditions which defile. This list also consists of two different groups, evil acts and moral defects. I want to consider the conditions of the heart that Jesus lists. First... In Mark chapter 7 and verse 21, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Jesus begins with the evil thought from which the evil action comes. The foundation for evil acts is the evil thought. These are well-considered acts. Every outward act of sin is preceded by an inward act of choice. This man realizes what he is doing and he does it anyway. Evil thoughts. Next, Jesus lists, lists adulteries. This is a sexual relation in which one of the partners is married to someone else. This is a violation of the marriage vow. And it's evil, Jesus says. Fornications, he lists next. This covers every kind of sexual corruption. Extramarital relations, which is having sex without being married, right? This is evil, incest, homosexuality, orgies, bestiality. Every single one of these things is covered under the word fornication and is considered evil by God. Then murders. We all think we know what murders is, right? But this doesn't just describe the killing of another human being. This describes all violent deeds, Beating on someone, kicking on someone, punching them while they're down. Hatred, evil intentions towards someone. That's all covered in the word murders by Jesus. Thefts, he lists next. This covers every type of stealing. This is a mean, deceitful, dishonorable pilferer. Let's consider Judas, as a matter of fact, from the Gospel of John. So we're in Mark. Luke, John, chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. John, chapter 12, and verse 4. <clears throat> 4 through 6. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it, right? Judas was a pilferer. He was a sneaky thief who took from the poor and gave to himself. Then Jesus lists covetousness. This is from two Greek words, which mean to have more. The spirit that snatches at that which is not right to take. That's covetousness. The lust in the heart of man who sees happiness in things, but not just things, things that other people have. He doesn't want his own things. He wants what you have and what you have. That's covetousness. <clears throat> Let's consider Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. 
Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, idolizing things. That's covetousness. Next, Jesus lists wickedness, which is also in the Greek a form of the word evil. Evil. This represents the man in whose heart there is a desire to harm others. This word for evil is used in reference to Satan when he is called the evil one. So, this evil or wickedness not only affects the man who has it, but others as well. This often involves deception. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. We're in Colossians, just a couple of books forward, and you're in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. 2 Timothy 3, 13. But evil men... And imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're liars, right? Which leads us into the next thing that Jesus lists, deceit. This comes from a word which means to bait and is used for trickery. The idea of a mouse trap, right? You put that peanut butter or that cheese or whatever it is, you put it on the mouse trap, and that mouse is like, mmm, yummy food, right? But it goes to eat it and no more mouse. Deceit. You've deceived. Sorry if I scared people. I hope you didn't have a heart attack. <laughs> this is fraud, concealed dishonesty, dishonesty, falsehood, cunning, and treachery. Now I have to get my bearings back because I, I thought I was going to kill Christy there for a second. <laughs> All right. So then Jesus lists lewdness in the list of things that defile a man. A disposition of the soul that resents all discipline. So those who hate discipline, you are a lewd person, basically. The one who is lost to decency and to shame. This, is fraught. this, is individ this individual never hesitates to shock his fellow man. They will constantly shock you with the things they are willing to do. They are lewd. Then he says, an evil eye. This is the eye that looks at the success and happiness of another in such a way that it would cast an evil spell on it if it could. It's crazy the things you learn when you actually do word studies on things in the scripture. This individual actually grieves at the happiness of others. Those who have an evil eye. I can't believe they're so happy. That makes me so mad that you're happy. Why are you smiling and laughing? I hate it. Right? I mean, seriously. How hardcore can you get than having an evil eye? Blasphemy is the ideal of insulting man or God. And we always think it's about God, but it's not just God. It's man that we can blaspheme as well. This is abusive language against man or God. This is slander or defaming of name. Jesus then lists pride. This is the principal characteristic of an unregenerate man. Showing oneself above everything, most of the time even above God himself. This is the attitude of a man who has a certain contempt for everyone except for himself. The Greeks also use this to describe an attitude that may never become public, meaning that this individual may seem humble on the outside, but on the inside, in his heart, he is proud. Sometimes this pride is evident. This is a glorification of oneself. You remember the Pharisee and the tax collector? Lord, please help me not to be like this tax collector, right? Very proud in everything that he did. When the Lord names seven things that he hates that are an abomination in his sight, a proud look is the first thing on the list. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. God hates pride. Then Jesus says, Foolishness. Foolishness. This is not the brainless folly or a weak intellect of a person. This describes not the man who is a brainless fool, but the man who, as we say, is playing the fool. I liken this to those who say, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. You're playing the fool, right? Don't play the fool. Jesus also explains why these defile a man. 
These things are evil, he says in verse 23. Mark chapter 7 and verse 23. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. They are things which are contrary to God's nature. Let's consider 1 John chapter 1. Go with me there, almost to the back of the Bible. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. First John chapter 1 and verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. These things are evil, which makes them darkness, which makes them contrary to the nature of God. Now let's look at Ephesians. Go back with me to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That is what is right. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. These are devices of man. These don't come from God. They are those things which come from us as human beings. Look at Romans chapter 1. Go back just a couple of books to Romans chapter 1. And let's look at verses 28 through 32. Romans 1, 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. This is debased, not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. That one always throws me. Man, that's mixed in with people who murder disobeying your parents undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God to those who practice such things are that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Made by man, these sins are. They are works of the flesh. Move forward with me now to Galatians. Romans, first and second Corinthians, Galatians. Chapter 5 and verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19 and going through verse 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice these things, these things of the flesh, will not inherit the kingdom of God. This must have been a startling Revelation for Jesus' apostles. They were trained by these scribes and Pharisees in the idea of spiritual purity through their rituals. Jesus is telling them that fellowship with God is not destroyed because of foods or unwashed hands. It is destroyed because of the sin that comes from man's heart. The religious leaders of Jesus' time could have washed their hands hundreds of times a day, and this would not have made them any more spiritually pure. As long as their hearts were filled with sin and they turned from God's commands to follow their man-made traditions, they remained defiled. Why? 
Why did they remain defiled? Because true spiritual defilement is a condition of the heart and is a direct result of neglecting God's commands. The same is true for us today, as it was for them then, as it was for them in the Old Testament. Unless we examine ourselves and seek true spiritual purity by being obedient to God's commands and work at removing sin, removing it from our lives, not just um, not practicing it, but removing it completely, we will be found to be spiritually defiled. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you, Jesus said. No amount of attending Sunday or Wednesday services is going to change this. You can't practice whatever you want. Come sit down in this pew and think that you're safe. It doesn't work that way. Not with God. No amount of works will make us spiritually pure if we continue to allow sin to be enthroned upon our hearts. You can go out and you can help the poor and you can help people do this and door knock and do all that stuff. But if you're not living your life according to God, those works don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. These acts only find favor with God when they are coupled with a mind that seeks to obey his commands of removing sin from one's life and living pure and holy before him, continuing to obey his commands until you die. Thankfully, God has provided a way for us to accomplish true spiritual purification. First, we must hear his word, right? For faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Then we start down that road of spiritual purification when we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the one who died for our sins, John 8, 24. At the realization of this fact, we must determine to set our mind on a path of spiritual purification. We are compelled to repent and turn away from our sins, Acts 17, 30. We continue towards spiritual purification as we confess Christ as our sovereign Lord, Matthew 10, 32. We take the final step into spiritual purification as we obey God's command to be baptized, 1 Peter 3.21. It is here that we receive the forgiveness of sins in obedience to his will, Acts 2.38. It is here that we enter into a covenant relationship with God and find ourselves consecrated to his service, Acts 2.47. From this point on, we continue to live a life consecrated to God, seeing ourselves as instruments of righteousness, carrying out his will and his will only in our lives. Romans 6, 7, 12 through 13. Over and over and over again, everything we do is to be to the glory of God. If you're ready to begin your path of spiritual purification, the waters of baptism are ready for you. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you long to have the prayers of the saints for encouragement, because you know that you don't put God first in your life and you don't do everything according to his commands and what he wants you to do and to his glory, then let us encourage you to do that. Come forward as we stand and sing. Oh. 
sit down. You have something? You want to lead it before the sure. prayer? Michael likes to have a closing song, and as you can see from the board behind me, this one will be Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies, strong in the strength which God supplies from his eternal Son. Strong then in Christ of hosts, and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trust, who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endured but take to arm you for the fight but take to arm you for the fight no plea of God leave no unguarded place no weakness of the the whole that having all things done and all your conflicts past you may or come through Christ alone you may or come through Christ alone and stand in time with me please holy father we're thankful that you've blessed us so that we could come together and study and praise you we thank you for your word and for the ability that you've given us to understand it to be obedient to it we thank you for jesus who is the word that he came and gave himself so that we might have this privilege of approaching you in prayer through him. And Father, we pray now that you'll bless us as we're dismissed, that you'll be with us and keep us safe as we travel and go about the activities of the day and the week. Help us to be the best examples possible for others to see Christ living in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Just a couple of announcements or a few announcements and then we'll be dismissed. Remember the, the uh, meetings immediately following service? The men will meet downstairs and the women, I don't know where you'll meet, but the women's business meeting as well uh, is planned immediately following the service. The women's Bible study will be May the 11th, and that's at 7 o'clock here at the building. Chapter 10, it says here, for those who are in that class. The men's Bible study will be May the 4th, and that's this coming Thursday at 7 o'clock here at the building. Chapter 2. Is it Chapter 2? Mike? Yo, Mike. <laughs> chapter 2 in Muscle and Shovel? Yes. I thought we did that one. Okay. Chapter 2, Muscle and Shovel. Thursday, 
uh, here at the building. Uh, our gospel meeting begins the next Sunday, May 7th through the 10th. Art Smith will be here. We know Art. He's a good minister. He's worthy to come and hear, and he'll have a message for us that will help us to live better lives and to be stronger Christians. And that's this also the first Sunday of the month, so it's our Pollock Sunday. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for those who'd like to bring food for that uh, potluck and invite others, of course, uh, to come and participate with us. <clears throat> Up women, upcoming Women's Coffee, May 13th, and that's at Christie's house. If you need more information about that, see Christie. Uh, if you have a secret sister, you are encouraged to remember her. I guess some have forgotten their secret sisters, and so that's, um, that's a no-no. If you sign up for the program or the, do that, please follow through and remember your secret sister. Remember to pray for those who are mentioned in the bulletin. There are several on the prayer list there. Uh, the, the congregation is beginning a door-knocking campaign. We meet Sunday night this afternoon at 6 o'clock here at the building. We'll go for about an hour and door knock and then come back. And so we encourage everyone to participate in that and uh, help reach others. This was also an opportunity to advertise our gospel meeting to our community so that others might be able to hear about it and come and participate with us in the gospel meeting. Uh, Kennedy is not here this morning. She got some bad news about her grandmother. She went to the hospital, her grandmother did in Texas, and they thought it was pretty serious, but now they've decided that it was probably just a reaction to her heart medicine. But Kennedy's still not here. So she's asked for our prayers on behalf of her grandmother. So please remember her grandmother, who's in, in, uh, still in the hospital in Texas. That's all the announcements that I have at this time, so we are dismissed. Thank you for your patience.